Our next speaker, if you've been to our workshops before, he's an old hand, but if you're new, this is Alex Zaragoza. He's a, he's a professor of history in the Department of Ethnic Studies. Um, he used to be the chair of the Center for Latin American Studies, as well as the director of the UC Study Center in Mexico. Uh, his most recent book is the Mexico Today, an encyclopedia of life in the Republic. And as I was telling someone earlier, you could ask Alex to talk about mushrooms on Mars, and he'd come up with a great talk. So. <laughs> Mexicans on Mars. <laughs> That's where we're going next. <laughs> um, so yeah, so he's going to give us, uh, trying to bring it into the Latin America, bring a, bit, a little bit more of the Latin American aspect into, of it into our discussion. OK, thank you, Jean. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for being here today. Um, uh, I'm going to try and end early to allow for Q&A uh, because if you've ever <coughs> noticed, and I'm sure all of you have, that if you go south of the Rio Bravo, otherwise known as the Rio Grande, there's a lot of countries between that river and Patagonia. So to try to cover all of that is, of course, uh, not possible with any degree of depth, particularly in light of the time that I have. So I have focused on those two countries that have been the major magnets of internal immigration within Latin America. And those two countries are Chile and Argentina. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that other countries don't receive people from other parts of Latin America, Mexico perhaps being among the most, the most obvious uh, in terms of the Central Americans that have moved from that region to the United States in which uh, a large, well, fairly large number have remained in Mexico for a variety of different reasons, and Costa Rica, um, uh, which is another magnet, if you will. But those two magnets do not raise necessarily the same kinds of issues that were raised in Shenandoah necessarily. I think in part because so many of the Central Americans given uh, their, their motive for get coming to or going to Mexico, they were primarily on their way to the United States. And in that respect, the United States remains overwhelmingly the largest magnet in terms of Latin American immigration, that is people <coughs> leaving their countries for another. Nonetheless, uh, the internal situation within Latin America uh, remains, in my opinion, of important interest. Uh, and in that respect, the, the film Shenandoah raises parallels of various sorts in terms of what is taking place in Latin America. Now, that said, um, after seeing the film for a third time, right, it still resonates with me in a very particular and very personal way. Uh, I don't know how many of you come from small towns. And there's that point in the film uh, about small town America. All right. I come, or I was reared in, one of the very few counties in the state of California that lost population between 1960 and 1970. I come from the San Joaquin Valley of California in which many small towns are basically dying in the same way that many communities in Latin America are dying. And there is very little chance of a transformative event or process that will enliven those communities again. Um, for those of you who've ever gone up and down 99 and have been, for whatever reason, pushed into moving uh, off the freeway onto communities like Dinuba, like Pixie, like Shafter, like Del Rey, like Riverdale, Carruthers, not to mention that metropolis called Kalinga on Highway 5, or Avenal, and so on, all right? And those communities have an important story, but a story that is usually not seen because we basically stopped there to get gas. I remember when the outpost of civilization arrived in Kettleman City, otherwise known as the In-N-Out. Oh. Right? <laughs> but those 
those communities are basically communities that parallel many of the aspects that we saw in Shenandoah. And, uh, and that's why I entitled this Deaths on Both Sides of the Border. Because the, what Shenandoah raises, among many other issues, is how a community is dying. I love that scene about the donut shop where you see the empty trays and she's talking about the decline of the demand for donuts. Inadvertently, coincidentally, I spent this weekend in my hometown where I got together with people that I've gone to school with uh, in three of the cases since kindergarten. And one of the women that I get together with every year or try to uh, at least twice a year, I've known since we were both four years old. All right? And we took uh, a drive down Main Street, the cruise, which at one end had a Daisy, uh, a Dairy Queen, and at the other end, the Big Top, where you always made the turn to go back down the Yosemite Avenue, where you cruised a la American Graffiti. The Big Top doesn't exist anymore. And in fact, we discussed the fact that one of our friends, Bernie Molina, um, just happened to know the person in charge of destroying the Big Top. And he kept the old machines where you punched a button and you called someone to bring you the milkshake, the hamburger, and they came on roller skates, <laughs> all right? Now, I know I'm dating myself. None of you remember that era, all right? But the important point here is that that is just one of the deaths that is taking place in the same way that Shenandoah is struggling to continue to survive in that small town environment that was threatened by the arrival of those newcomers. In that respect, then, let me start with a story. In January of 2001, uh, a woman was taking her 20-month-year-old son to the doctor. She lived on the outskirts of the city and took the equivalent of Caltrain or BART into the central city to see her doctor. In the midst of that short train ride, uh, she was subjected to racial epithets by one of the male train riders on that train. And very quickly, four or five, then 10 or 12 people began to also hurl epithets at her. In a, cu a couple of cases, pushing her and shoving her. And the man who started the altercation became so incensed about her presence that before she could get to the station, she was thrown off that train. And she and her 20-month-year-old son were run over by the train. And needless to say, died. Her name was Marcelina Meneses. She was a Koya Indian from the highlands of Bolivia who was working uh, in one of the sweatshops of Buenos Aires. And Marcelina's death in certain ways parallels the death of Jose Luis Ramirez. Now, in Argentina in 2005, an institute was established to deal with the question of discrimination and racism in that country. But to date, the rules and regulations uh, of the law that established that national institute have not been passed by the Argentine legislature. So even though the institute exists and the laws exist, the rules and regulations to implement that law have yet to be signed by the president of Argentina. Part of the reason, no doubt, is the reluctance of some legislators to deal with the, uh, an electorate that in many cases continues to be prejudiced toward those particular groups in Argentina that they consider to be racially different, racially distinct, and in most cases,
consider them to be racially inferior. All right. And there's a whole vocabulary in Argentina, like in Chile, like in Venezuela, like in Mexico, etc., that have become racialized terms, like boliguayo, just to give you one example in the case of Argentina. Because boliguayo condenses or c conflates Bolivians with people from Paraguay, Bolivia, and it, in a sense, encapsulates all of those groups that are considered, quote unquote, racially inferior in Argentina. All right. Now that story, however, has a backstory, and one of the things I really like about Shenandoah, it doesn't immediately become a binary between them and us. It's a story with a lot of complexities. It doesn't delve just simply into the, race, the racist whites and the poor, <coughs> victimized Mexicans, at least in this particular case, because it complicates the story in a variety of different ways. All right? It is complicated, first and foremost, it seems to me, by the question of gender. Because what we see in Shenandoah is masculinity being redefined. And that redefinition is invested, in a sense, in those men who go to the football games, by those men who brag about shooting the deer, and most graphically, those men who remember the coal mines and how their sense of self was so tied by the work, that masculine work, that manly work, that was tied to working in the mines. In the same way that for many Ecuadorian men, for many Peruvian men, for many men from other parts of Latin America who perforce, often out of economic necessity, are pushed to move, Bolivian miners who have had their minds closed and have to work as um, waiters, for example, which leads to an important subtext and that is the feminization of labor that has taken place on both sides of the border. It is no coincidence that the wage gap between men and women in the United States has shrunk, not only because more women are working, but also because of the stagnation in wages that has taken place in the United States for men. And if you look carefully at the statistics a large proportion of the lessening of the wage gap between men and women. It's not because women are making such fabulous salaries and wages. It's because so many men are working at, relatively speaking, low wages, in large part because of the feminization of labor. And for a lot of men, they can't take it. It's no coincidence that 75% of the female immigrants from Peru and Bolivia in Buenos Aires are working in the formal sector, going to factories and working, albeit admittedly in horrible conditions, <coughs> low wages and the like. But a much larger proportion of those same men are not working in the formal sector. They're working in the informal sector as street vendors and the like because they can't bring themselves to work in the garment factories making dresses <coughs> for women. So masculinity is an important subtext of the story I'm going to try to tell today. Second, class differences. The statistics do not tell you that many of the Chileans working in Argentina left Argentina during the period of the dictatorship of Pinochet. Many of them from the middle class, many of them educated, and so on. There are not Mapuche Indians from the southern part of Chile that are undereducated and the like. So in that sense, the statistics don't tell us the differences among those newcomers that are on your page. You have to kind of dig, in a sense, a little deeper. And in no way are Chileans necessarily mistaken for Peruvians, because most <coughs> of the Peruvians are of an indigenous background. And many class prejudices come to play in the ways in which Argentines and Chileans treat Bolivians and Peruvians, for example. All right? 
A third element is then, in fact, the history of race, racism, ethnic prejudice in Latin America itself. It goes back to the colonial period. Those of you who've heard uh, me speak and others speak on Latin America and so on, we always raise the issue of racial mixing. The development for 400 years in Latin America of racialized social structures, otherwise known as the casta system. All right? And you don't erase 400 years of history very quickly. All right? So a lot of those attitudes then come to play. For example, the term cabecita negra, <coughs> blackhead. What they are really suggesting here is that the true Chileans have light hair and are light complected as opposed to the blackheads, the cabezas negras <coughs> that have infiltrated the country. And it's no coincidence that last year one of the best sellers in Santiago was a book entitled Identidad Chilena, <coughs> Chilean Identity. And one of the major themes of that book was the influx of newcomers that are diluting, undermining notions of what it means to be Chilean in the same way that the Mexican newcomers into Shenandoah, right, implicitly, if not explicitly, raise the question, what is the identity of our town in that respect? Another element is national rivalries. There's a long history of national rivalries in Latin America. Guatemalans versus Mexicans. Colombians versus Venezuelans. Chileans versus everyone. <laughs> well, particularly Bolivia and Peru, because it was a war among those three countries that the Chileans won, and the Peruvians and Chileans have never forgotten. And in fact, that treaty of 1904 that ended what became known as the Nitrate War, because a large part of that war was over who was going to control those incredibly, at that time, um, profitable fields that produced nitrates for various <laughs> kinds of industries, mining industry and the like. All right. And Chile won. As a result of that treaty, which was, in the minds of many Bolivians, under duress, signed under duress, Bolivia became a landlocked country, losing its access to the Pacific. The Chileans promised they would make a railroad to connect Chilean ports now to La Paz, the capital. But the Bolivians never forgot. And if, you've ever, if you get a chance, see the last soccer game earlier this year, in just through two weeks ago, between Bolivia and Chile. This was not just a game, <laughs> all right? This was a matter of national honor in the same way that if you know anything about the history of Catalonia and Barcelona in particular, when Barcelona, Barça, plays Real Madrid, this is not just a soccer game. This relives at least 500 years of history between the central government in Madrid versus the Catalans in Barcelona. In that, in that regard, just uh, uh, in April of this year, the Peruvian ambassador was in a grocery store. And two, uh, amb the ambassador to um, to Ecuador, and two Ecuadorian women allegedly cut in front of him at the supermarket. He became incensed and began to yell at the women in very derogatory terms. And the daughter of the older woman, who was, of course, her mother, all right, she would not take it. The mother kept trying to say he, she was sorry, and the Peruvian ambassador 
kept excoriating them and so on. And finally the daughter, no longer tied necessarily to those old rules about differences of class and so on, slapped him across the face. <laughs> All right. Caused an international incident because it was captured, of course, by a camera at the supermarket. And eventually, the Peruvian ambassador was recalled and was not allowed to go back to Ecuador. All right. National rivalries. And of course, it was splashed all over the newspapers in Ecuador. Peruvians were aghast that an Ecuadorian dare slap our ambassador, and so on, right? So those of us who watch the evening news, all right, you can imagine what, what that looked like uh, on the evening news in those countries. <coughs> um, and the last point I want to emphasize is downward mobility. That last scene was heart-rendering of Shenandoah, where the woman says, we're no longer middle class. We're lucky if we're poverty class, <coughs> if you remember that line. All right. In that sense, like so many people in Shenandoah have gone through a process of downward mobility, so it has happened in many parts of Latin America. And one of the reasons for that is a point that I want to start with now, my formal comments. Because migration in Latin America is a process. All right? It's a process. It's not like one event happens and pew, migration takes off, like we had in the United States with the Immigration Reform and Control Act. All, right? All of a sudden, boom! Within five months, we had to swallow, in a sense, digest 2.7 million immigrants to the United States from Mexico. 55% of them would eventually reside in one state. And you know what state that was? California. All right. And unfortunately, IRCA came to its conclusion, if you will, five years after its passage, passage in 1986, in 1991-92. And what happened to the economy of California in 1991-92? It went off a cliff. Right. And guess what happened? Proposition 187. <coughs> All right. In the same way, in the same way, uh, uh, what's happened in Latin America is that unlike IRCA, migration has been a process. And let me start with one that is absolutely fundamental to understanding internal migration in Latin America, and that is rural to urban migration, because it's been going on for so long in Latin America, particularly in the latter part of the 19th century and ever since. The railroad was very important in that respect. The industrialization of various cities in Latin America, whether it's Monterrey, Nuevo León, or whether it's Buenos Aires, or whether it's Santiago, or Lima, as the case happened to be. All right. So people from the hinterland came to the city. In most cases, originally, to only stay long enough to make some money and go back. Because the money to be made in the city was so much greater than what was taking place in the countryside. And uh, there's a wonderful photo uh, in the archives in Mexico City where it shows four men still in their Muslim cotton peasant dress looking up at a skyscraper in Mexico City. All right. And what's interesting about that, about that picture is not the man with the serapis clearly and, and, and I should say in huaraches, uh, sandals and this sort of thing, obviously from the countryside, marveling at the Latin American tower in Mexico City in 1948. Right? What was really interesting about that photo are the two people walking down the street seeing these men and the look on their faces. Parentheses, what the hell are you doing here? Right. Rural to urban migration shook the moorings, right? shook the foundations of many communities, loosening, if you will, what had been very tightly knit, in most cases, communities. And of course, it was led primarily, initially, by men. Men 
who went to Lima, men who went to Caracas, men who went, who went to Havana, men who went to um, uh, Buenos Aires, as the case happened to be. All right? In this regard, that process has accelerated over time. Now, it ha has accelerated in part simply due to the urbanization of rural areas. You know, many sociologists talk about the ruralization of cities. But if you're going to have the ruralization of cities, then you obviously have to look at it dialogically, dialectically, because to the extent that cities are being ruralized, it is also the case that rural communities are being urbanized. Every time an Ecuadorian goes back to Cuenca during Christmas, because you got a home, you, there are two days you absolutely have to go back. One is Christmas, and the other one is Mother's Day. <laughs> All right? And when you go back, what do you bring with you? Well, just like my students and the new parents I just talked to who just been admitted, when they leave Berkeley after being here for the orientation for new students, what do they go back with? They go back with collectibles. The Cal cap, the Cal sweater, the Cal t-shirts, the Cal banners, pictures of Cal, things they put on the refrigerator and so on. As soon as somebody comes over, I'm sure, for the July 4th weekend barbecue and so on, they're going to come out in their regalia of Cal. Parentheses, my son got into Cal, right? sort of thing. In the same way that Ecuadorians getting off the airport in their capital city, most of them fly in to Guayaquil, all right? What you see is all these people out there who come in buses, in some cases on train, in some cases they've been able to commandeer, in a sense, a car and so on, to greet the returning heroes, especially at Christmas. And I love those newspaper stories of, of the Ecuadorians arriving because the, the stories are all about the Christmas presents that they have brought back <clears throat> all right, from wherever they have gone. And the remittances that have transformed over time many of these communities. And literally, if you go to almost any part of Latin America where you've seen sizable out internal migration and they come back, you see the houses of those people who have been working in Buenos Aires, have been working in Santiago and so on, and they are new and made out of cinder block and so on. They have actual windows on them. They even have screens on them. They have doors on them. And of course, they have a dish. Not an antenna, they have a dish. <laughs> All right? In that sense, um, then this process is ongoing, but it has accelerated. I'll just mention one accelerating factor, television. Because if you stop and think about it, some of you may remember the first time you saw a color television. Remember that? Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> right? And inevitably, people unlike yourselves, people who are not as sophisticated, not as well educated, not as tied to notions of material possessions and so on, people who are in fact tied to those things. They have to have the color TV as opposed to the black and white. But once you see the color television, it's hard to go back to the black and white, especially when you have someone pulling on your leg. How come we don't have one? That's the urbanization of rural communities. And that urbanization of rural communities was greatly accelerated with television. Because now, not only did you hear class difference, not only did you hear the difference between where you live and where those other people live, now you saw it. <coughs> you saw it. And all those women who are working as domestics in Santiago, they go back at Christmas. And even if they only go for two or three days, they come back with a different notion what it means to be feminine. And one of the reasons is things like watching television. None of us are, are how shall I say it, 
influenced by advertisements and so on, but some people are. <laughs> All of us have seen, right? You use this shampoo and your hair sheens, right? And it waves in slow motion. Oh yeah, I want that kind of hair too, all right? If you wear this foundation, my favorite is Shiseido, all right? <laughs> That's color-coded, right? Now, right, you turn a wheel. This is a color for you. You don't have to go to Macy's, right? And have a, cosmetic, a cosmetic person tell you, oh, this is the right one for you. You can do it at home now, all right? And all of these women, just like many men, watching these advertisements, watching the soap operas and so on, a whole other world is not only heard, but now seen. Children sitting next to parents, wanting those things that you see on the television. And I'm part of that generation that remembers Spin and Marty. None of you remember that. You're too young. One of the first TV series for young people on the Disney program, played by Annette Funicello. <laughs> Now, that name may resonate for those of you who've been to museums, all right? <laughs> et cetera, all right? In that sense, the ruralization of cities had a corresponding urbanizing effect. And with television, all of those motives, pressures, emotions, and so on, accelerated that migration. That migration was accelerated then by other factors. One of those that has to be mentioned are the economic crises that hit various parts of Latin America. I can't go through all of them. I'll mention only one, the banking crisis in 1999-2000 in Ecuador. Most people don't never heard about it. Most of the people don't know anything about it. But you ask any Spaniard in Madrid about the Ecuadorian, and they will speak at length of these people who should go back. And right now, Spain is offering a bounty, 3,000 euros, for Ecuadorians to go back to their country. Very few takers thus far. All right. And to a large extent, similar attitudes, if you look at some of the graffiti in Buenos Aires, exists toward the people from Paraguay. They want them to go back. And in Paraguay, as some of you may know, there's been a long-term economic crisis, tremendous unemployment that makes Spain look like Disneyland by comparison. Right? Uh, in that respect, those economic crises, and we could go through several of them and so on, contributes to that process. A third factor, political crisis. Um, again, most of you are too young, but there was a social movement in the highlands of Peru called Sendero Luminoso, Shining Path. Tremendous violence. In a two-year period, a town called Ayacucho lost 50% of its population in a two-year period due to that political crisis. Inaugurated, orchestrated, if you want, by President Fujimori at that time of Peru. And again, the political crisis in Chile, Pinochet, political crisis, dictatorship in Argentina, political crisis in other parts of Latin America at various points in time have contributed to out-migration. A fourth factor, narco-refugees, a new term, people fleeing drug-related violence. Colombia is, of course, kind of like the textbook case. The violence of the 1980s and early 1990s, when there was a crackdown on the Colombian drug lords, Pablo Escobar became uh, almost a, a household name in the United States because we were after him, we finally got him, and so on. Cocaine production is alive and well, thank you very much, in Colombia to this day. But the important point here is the violence that took place in Colombia during that period of time, leading many Colombians to leave to those countries that they consider to be much safer, all right? Uh, Ciudad Mier, right near the Tamaulipas border. Some of you perhaps heard about it. 
because uh, of an earlier event. Um, actually, it, it was discovered uh, late last year where 50 or so immigrants, most of them from Central America, were found in a shallow grave very close to the Tamaulipas border. Violence is rampant in that part of that northern state of Tamaulipas. All right. And people moved from Ciudad Mer, right there, right near where, those, where that grave was found, to Ciudad Aleman, a much bigger city with a larger police force and with uh, the perception that somehow people would be safer there. The Monterrey Tech, the MIT of Mexico in Monterrey, 25% drop in students attending that university in the last two years due to the violence in Monterrey, Nuevo León. Ciudad Juarez, between 2007 and 2010, lost 500,000 people, mainly due to the perception, again, of lack of public security due to the violence in the drug cartels. All right. In many parts of Ecuador and Peru on the Amazon side, as some of you may know, because of the use of Agent Orange in Colombia and the attempt to spray coca leaves and so on, which has lessened production, it hasn't ended it, it has lessened production in Colombia. Well, the growing of coca leaves just moved, in a manner of speaking, to the Amazon side because of climate and so on of Peru and Ecuador. All right. Narco uh, refugees. And again, this is a process. It starts small and then accelerates. When you are making only $2 a day in US dollars, and someone is willing to pay you $200 a week to keep an eye on the coca leaves that you're growing, I'm not sure many of us would not be tempted to give up getting $2 a day as opposed to $200 a week. And I suspect some of you know teachers who move to other school districts mainly because of increase in salary uh, in that respect. So if we're willing to do it, you can imagine what a poor peasant farmer, a poor miner who has been laid off or has been had his hours reduced and so on will do as well. All right. The fifth factor, which is much more difficult to define, is for lack of a better term, a growing sense of autonomy among women. Young women who are willing to move away from the village to go work, whether it's in Santiago or Buenos Aires or Caracas. Right. Now keep in mind that Caracas has been a magnet for domestics. Why? Oil money, right? Oil money, right? So to the extent that people have the opportunity to have discretionary income that allows them to hire a servant, they will do it. Right? In the same way that some of the new wealth in Santiago, Chile, has led to a boom in the number of families who have the means to hire a servant. And the recovery of the Argentine economy has allowed an increasing proportion of the population to hire servants. And I suspect some of us, given the opportunity, given the means, I don't know if I want to vacuum. I don't know if I want to wash dishes. I don't know if I want to wash the clothes and so on, if I can hire someone to do it. And needless to say, as some of you know, there's a lot of domestic workers here in the United States, most of them from Latin America. All right. uh, in, in this sense, then, all of these often combine one with the other, all right? Uh, and uh, in the handout, I want to jump, in a sense, to uh, the last page. Because we have come up with fancy terms for things, right? I think one of the most powerful factors that explains Latin American migration internally is relative deprivation. This is a fancy term for what in Mexico we call envidia, mm -hmm. all right? That is the kind of comparison. In English, we call it keeping up with the Joneses, all right? The comparison that inevitably occurs. I'm part of that generation that my mom had a washing machine 
the kind that went back and forth, and you had uh, a, a, a hand uh, uh, squeeze thing, right? That would squeeze out the water, all right? And when her best friend, Aurora, which no one called Aurora, they already called her Vola, all right? Uh, when Vola got a washing machine, those early washing machines, now again, most of you are too young to remember those early washing machines, right, that you lifted up the top and so on. Now, of course, we have it facing us, right, with all of the pictures, right, uh, all of the buttons, I should say, uh, and the like, um, which brings me, of course, to that wonderful movie, El Norte, right? Remember that? Where she's trying to figure out the washing machine uh, and this sort of thing? Relative deprivation. Right? This notion that you are now deprived relative to those others who, for whatever reason, remittances or what have you, have means to buy things that you cannot. And what becomes a novelty becomes a necessity. All right? Those of you who grew up in hot areas like the San Joaquin Valley, like myself, air conditioning has become a necessity. You get into a car, you're going to ask people, God, man, put on the air conditioning, all right? Um, I don't have any. What do you mean you don't have air conditioning? <laughs> the hell is wrong with you, all right, sort of thing, all right? Okay, just like the opposite. Having in Wisconsin, having a car that doesn't have a heater, all right? The urbanization of youth, because notions of youth have changed. I'm old enough to remember that being 12 or 13, you were an adult because you went to work. All right? Now we have a longer period of gestation of youth. All right? It starts somewhere about eight or nine now because kids who are eight or nine don't want to be treated like they're kids. All right? I went to the movies recently and there were a lot of nine-year-olds walking up and down the mall on my way to the film. All right? Little packs of little girls popping into H&M, Mary Claire. They are not little girls anymore. It's thank you. All right? We, call, we have a name for them. We call them preteens. All right? The boys, of course, following them around and so on, acting like they're five or six, but that's another story. <laughs> all right? Sort of thing. All right? Youth has changed. And again, a multiplicity of factors toward, uh, toward understanding that process. But what's important for us to understand is the urbanization of youth has accelerated, just like it's accelerated here, it has accelerated in Latin America. And that youth notion of youth, unlike in the United States, that can go all the way to 24 or 25, if you've ever seen the movie Jackass or Badass, <laughs> not to mention our uh, students here at Berkeley. Um, I won't mention other schools. I'll just say to my side of the border in a manner of speaking. All right. <laughs> the urbanization of youth has extended that. Right. The pressures on young people to stay in school is part of that extension of youth. Right. You're supposed to go to school, not necessarily to work. And if you do go to school and you want to work, you've got to do it after school. Right. It doesn't come, become primary. It becomes secondary, which allows for youth to be extended and allows young people to get those things that are associated with youth, whether it's a, a boom box in my day and age, or whether it's now an, uh, an, a phone, a cell phone, or whether it's in the form of clothes, uh, et cetera, right? All of these things has changed the notions of youth in Latin America. People do not want to stay in their hometown. And you can go to Zacatecas, in the same way that you can go to various villages like Cerro, uh, Cerro de Pocha in Peru, and you won't find young people there. All you find are old people who lament what is happening to their community. And they wonder, when we die, what's going to happen to this community? Will it also die? Third, stratification and remittances. All right. In most of these communities now, in which you've had fairly long-term internal migration, remittances have created stratification. And that stratification has added to the motives for migration. 
In that respect, relative deprivation often works in conjunction with stratification and remittances. And to the extent that young people benefit from those remittances, they are more likely to want to replicate the sources of that remittances. So you have a lot of young Bolivian men living in shacks and so on in and around Cordoba and Mendoza, Argentina. Why? Because they're working in the wine industry of Argentina. And as many of you know who drink wine, the rage right now, or at least certainly last year, were Malbecs. Right? Just like the year before that, it was Tempranillo. And before that, it was Pinot Noir, etc. All right. In that respect, young Bolivian men then get on a bus and they go to Mendoza or they get on a bus and they go to Cordoba and they hang out. And if you go to Mendoza, you can go to the Bolivian bars because nothing but Bolivian guys hang out there. All right. You can go to the Bolivian stores because that's where the Bolivians hang out and so on. All right. And in that sense, stratification tied to those Bolivian men is reflected in various villages in the highlands uh, of Bolivia. As I mentioned earlier, gender and migration. I mean, since 1995, in Buenos Aires, as, I, uh, as it's indicated in your handout, all right, 79%, I believe, if I recall correctly my figures, 79% of all of the females in Buenos Aires from Peru have come since 1995. Well, what happened is young girls in towns of the original towns, ascending communities in Peru, see their sister, see their aunt, see their cousin, right, going to Buenos Aires and coming back. Yeah, maybe they're not well made. Maybe they're knockoffs of Gucci's or, or um, I don't know, Prada or whatever it may be. But they come back in heels that they wear at the, at the local dance that always occurs at Christmas in their communities or at the patron saint fiesta or a festival uh, and the like. And if you've, uh, my, my largest or greatest experiences with Mexican, you go to these small towns that have their patron saint festival and so on, in which many immigrant men and young women come back and so on, and it's usually in some small little hall and so on, and it's, you know, it's just basically vinyl tile and so on, but people are dressed to the T, especially the young girls. They want to show off that they've been working as domestics in Los Angeles, and they go back with the hose now, with uh, the kind of <coughs> patterns and this sort of thing, and their high heels, and their skirts and this sort of thing, and their H&M tops, uh, et cetera. Not to mention with their hairdos and, and their makeup uh, and the like. And that same thing is being replicated all over those receiving communities as well because of the clustering effect and the kind of social and cultural circuits that are created by that migration. And gender is important here because unlike the United States, where we marry for love, we don't worry about the, the educational or projected income of our spouses or potential partners and so on. We marry for love. But as any young man can tell you, and any young woman can tell you, that courtship in many of these communities are tied to migration especially if he or she has papers, which allows he or she to sustain a certain level of income as opposed to being deported or caught and so on. All right? One of the interesting things that's happening in both Chile, uh, in Chile is illegal immigration. Argentina passed a law in 2005, the one I mentioned earlier, that makes migration a human right and no one can be treated differently, that is, in a discriminating way, because they are immigrants, regardless of their legal status. That doesn't mean that Argentines don't discriminate, but it does mean that Argentina faced up to the fact that racism, discrimination was taking place in Argentina. But say that to the people from Paraguay and so on. 
racism, discrimination, still takes place. And the last is class and migration. Because a lot of the resentment toward newcomers is often about class. Particularly when a class feels threatened, feels menaced by the presence of those newcomers. And Shenandoah is a lot about that story, right? A, a people who feel somehow hard-pressed, people who feel insecure. Back to my hometown is to go to a place like Shenandoah. It's no longer coal mining, but uh, the uh, bottling plant that employed a large proportion of people has closed down. The uh, cheap wine plant has down to 30% production because so much of the production has been sent to Modesto. The, bo uh, the bottling plant that used to put the wine uh, into bottles and so on has shut down. The wine is sent on huge uh, trucks um, and those uh, trucks that have liquid containers and so on and send up to Modesto uh, and so on. Um, many of the businesses can't compete with Fresno, which is only 20 miles away. Fresno with its Walmart, its Costco, its Kmarts, and so on, not to mention a Cineplex, nice shopping centers and the like. And the downtown of my hometown now, you see nothing but dollar stores, shuttered doors, empty storefronts, and the like, like you will find in many parts of the San Joaquin Valley in the same way that if you look carefully at that sad picture, I don't know if you remember it, and I don't know if Turnley waited for that rainy day, <coughs> right? And the, young, and the man is sitting uh, in front of the local business and so on, and you see the street and there's nothing on the street. Or the man who's talking about, oh man, you should have seen this town in the 1950s, right? Talking about the good old days, the parades <coughs> and so on. And now, Everything in that town is invested em emotionally, in many respects, on football. And to go to Madera High School Coyote football now, it's really kind of sad. Half the stadium is empty, and the people who do go there, if you looked at the sh stands of that town in Shenandoah, I don't know if you remember when the camera panned, a lot of older folks were there, right, reliving reanimating, rethinking their memories, and so on. Because that's a, a, one of the few things that they have left, in a manner of speaking. So I, unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, depending on your point of view, uh, at least based on what uh, happened today in the Supreme Court. Uh, but anyway, um, in the case of Shenandoah, there was an Office of Civil Rights that was able to prosecute some of the young men involved. And uh, their, the light sentence that was passed by the local jury was to a large extent canceled out by the prison sentences that went along with some of those young men involved uh, in the incident, uh, as you will recall. But Marcelina Meneses, no conviction. The man who threw her off that train, no one was willing to come forward. And to the extent that others were involved in pu pushing her, shoving her, and so on, no one was convicted, not even of simple assault. I'm sorry to say that um, this is a story that will likely continue in Latin America in the near future. Um, very few people, by the way, are going to Brazil. And one of the reasons is the language, right? Portuguese versus Spanish uh, in that respect. But I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of young people are taking classes at night in Portuguese in the same way that a lot of Ecuadorians, a lot of Chileans, and so on, I uh, pardon me, Bolivians, Peruvians, and so on. And uh, I just found this out in a local paper from Guayaquil recently, <coughs> taking classes in English after school because 70% of the Ecuadorians that have left that country are living now in the United States. Thank you very much. God, I was wondering where can I get some humor after watching that film again, you know? 
And I was watching it last night again on, the, on the, my computer and so on. And my uh, niece was over and she, Uncle Alex, how come you're crying? All right, I told her you gotta watch Shenandoah. All right, still gets to me, third time I've seen it. But that's okay, a lot of other movies make me cry that I've seen 20 times. Like Dr. Zhivago. <laughs> gets me every time, every time. He sees her walking down the street, we're trying to get out of the trolley car and his heart literally bursts for the love of Lada. Oh, kill him, kill him, love him. Okay, in terms of endearment, another one. Anyway. Okay, I'll stop here because I'm dating myself. None of you remember these films. Okay, all right, any Q&A? Yes? Um, it seems, I, I've known a couple people that have had, that are Mexican who have families back in Mexico and have families here. So it seems to me that one of the factors for women would be to follow their men just to keep a hold on them, so to speak. Mm -hmm. That's definitely the case. But again, what's happened recently, and I say recently, I'm a historic, right, last 10 years, is that a lot of women are going on their own. They're not waiting for a male companion, if you will. And just like you see Mexican migration to the United States changing in that regard, the same thing is taking place. Why? And you know we don't have the time here to talk about migration theory in any depth, but it's because of networks. And to the extent that a young female has an aunt, a cousin, whatever, that she can stay with in Buenos Aires, then she can make that bus ride uh, all the way from Peru to Buenos Aires over a two-day period, knowing that someone's going to be waiting for her at the other end. She's not waiting for her father, her big brother, uh, what used to be the case. Now, it's changing. And, uh, and part of it has to do with youth, but part of it has to do with the different sense of being a woman uh, in places like Peru. Because so many men cannot, if you will, pro be good providers in given what they expect now from their lives. Uh, and to the extent that notions of self and material um, uh, life has changed, then it has encouraged a lot of women all over Latin America to migrate on their own. And the feminization of labor just makes it easier, right? They know they can find jobs, um, uh, or at least they expect to be able to find jobs. And again, that's part of the network. You're, your cousin, your female cousin works at a, a, a garment sweatshop or something in Buenos Aires, uh, then it facilitates getting a job there, right? Etc. Okay. Yes? Um, is the, the racism in, in Argentina like about nationally, differences in nationality, oh. or is it that people from Bolivia and these other countries are more? It's different? a combination of things. Paraguayans have never loved Argentines. And if you know anything about Argentina, they have a stereotype that they don't speak Spanish, right? They speak God's language, <laughs> all right? They have a direct cell phone line to God. And that arrogance that allegedly is the case of Argentines, all right? And Mariana knows exactly what I'm talking about, all right? Uh, that's one of the reasons why she came to Berkeley to go through a process of re-education. <laughs> But I think she will be the first to admit that that streak, if you will, uh, of arrogance on the part of Argentines, uh, whether you believe it or not, people from Paraguay do, people from Bolivia do, people from Peru do. Not to mention the tension between Argentines and Chileans, all right? You want to see national rivalries? It's there. But in this particular case, because so many people from Paraguay from Ecuador, from Bolivia, from Peru, are indigenous looking, right? Mm -hmm. It adds to the perception that these people are undereducated, uneducated, crude, rough, you name all those adjectives of country hicks, uh, et cetera, and it feeds, it nourishes that sense of difference among Argentines toward those other people uh, in that respect. So it's a combination of all those things. It's class, it's race, uh, it's rivalries, all of those things come into play. And I might add that, you know, I could go give you lots of stories of what we, in this country we call hate crimes. 
but I didn't want to go through, you know, one incident after the other. Yeah, I mean, we get it right after watching Shenandoah. But uh, what's interesting to me in that respect, uh, in the case of Argentina and the case of Chile uh, in particular, is that the sum, if you will, of all of those elements come into play. It would be nice to say it's only about that, but in fact, it's many other things uh, in that regard. What's interesting to me, on the other hand, is the lack of retaliation. There's very little retaliation. Not, I, it's not because people don't want to retaliate, it's because they're afraid of what might happen to them in that respect. They don't trust the judicial system all right, uh, in that respect. And uh, 60 to 70 percent, according to this National Institute of Hate Crimes, as we would call them in this country, go unreported in Argentina. No one has even tried to estimate that for Chile uh, in that respect. Right? It happens, but no one has been able to quantify it. In the same way that in this country, a lot of hate crimes go unreported. A lot of high schools, people bumping into each other or throwing a punch and so on. And, you know, they don't want to report it. Uh, they think they might be looked at as a sissy or a snitch and so on. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that this happened when I was a kid, you know. Uh, that kind of stuff. And we could all, we always waited for foggy days because the teachers couldn't see the playground. And then we would retaliate. I, I, I don't take any pride in that. Right? But I'm a little bit surprised by the lack. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but the relative lack of retaliation uh, in that respect. Because um, a lot of the um, sureños, uh, the original origins of the sureños had a lot to do with the kind of violence that took place against recent Mexican immigrants, and they organized a gang, and that gang eventually led to the Sureños. And now, of course, it's become something entirely different. Yes, ma'am. Um, if, if current U.S. immigration policy prioritizes family relationships in determining who should be able to enter the mm -hmm. country, and the push to uh, uh, reprioritize mm -hmm. to job skills, Right. Do you see that really as sort of a real <coughs> racist effort to limit immigration from south of the border? Well, I think, oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, look, President Obama wants an immigration reform bill so bad, along with many other Democrats, that they've made a number of concessions. Uh, concessions that I find, quite frankly, outrageous in many respects, including this last craziness of adding another 20,000 border patrolmen and so on. But the, the important point here, it seems to me, is some people wanted that to happen because of racist ideas, plain and simple. Some people wanted that to happen because they don't want IRCA again, right? Because what happened in IRCA is we made family unification consistent with our 1965 Immigration Act and so on. So as soon as many or a large proportion, 80, 90 percent, of those who became legal, legal permanent resident, LPR green card holders, because of our 1965 Immigration Act, they turned right around and brought their wives, their immediate families, and so on. And for every immediate family, like, uh, first name? Leslie. Leslie, all right. If Leslie come, comes to the United States in 1991, 90, 1992, and she's a ravishing young 16 and so on, undoubtedly there's a young man somewhere in Michoacan <coughs> who has been ravished, if you will, by the desire to be with her, all right? And that led to even more migration uh, in that regard. And keep in mind that that migration took place in despite the fact that there was a recession going on. So, uh, so that's another factor. A third factor, it seems to me, is the perception that our immigration policy needs to change, like it has for other countries like Australia, Canada, and so on, is to create a merit system. A merit system that's colorblind. Right? But if you understand the dynamics of migration, then inevitably that process is racialized. The intent is not racism but it becomes racialized because the people less likely to merit those points 
that one will get in order to go up in a sense in line in terms of getting a visa and so on has a racialized consequence, mm -hmm. all right? And it's not racist, but we all know that there are many schools in, in the United States that are racialized. Right. And as we all know, the most de, um, segregated group now in schools in California are not blacks, are not Latinos, are not Asians, they are whites. That is, they are more likely to be in an all-white school than is the case for those other groups in terms of going to a school that's mostly black, mostly Latino, and so forth and so on. All right. No one uh, that I know of intended that to happen, but it has. Part of it is income inequality and so forth and so on. A lot of factors come into play. But in that respect, undoubtedly it's going to have a racialized consequence in which a relatively smaller and smaller proportion of groups from Latin America mm -hmm. will have an equitable opportunity to be admitted. All right. And that's my two-minute answer to, a, to a question that probably requires two weeks of lectures. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One is, um, and it's really what I was listening from all of this, it's just too small to be a major player. It would seem to be a Who's this? Uruguay. Uruguay, yes. Uh, so that's my first question, what about Uruguay and all of this? And the second one is, what about Southeast Asian people? And the Southeast Asians have migrated to South America and Central America quite a, quite a lot. And what's what In that? proportional terms, they still remain a very small percentage of the immigrants coming in from outside of Latin America. So uh, their impact has been relatively small. Uh, but they are all lumped as chinos. And one of the recent um, um, what vandalism that has taken place in Buenos Aires is afuera con los chinos. And it's all over the stores and restaurants that belong to chinos. And they can be various kinds of Asian groups uh, and so on. Uh, and part of it is, of course, that they tend to cluster in certain parts of the city because they can't afford to be on the main drag in Buenos Aires and so on, right? So just like ethnic groups have always had, they, they tend to cluster, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, that clustering is often in communities that are relatively low income or at best modest middle class income, uh, where again, a lot of young people uh, who are Argentine in this particular case uh, find themselves in that ambivalent situation, uh, et cetera. It's, again, I, I go back to the issue of masculinity uh, in that regard. A lot of young men in our own country and many other countries you know, have that sense of insecurity. And it gnaws, right? It corrodes that sense of masculinity, uh, it seems to me. Right? Which we don't, well, anyway, I'll leave it at that. Yes? I want to thank you so much for your insights and your comments. It's, uh, I will be thinking a long time about what you said, and thank you. And I, I just, as you were speaking, it thought of um, a program that I saw about China several years ago about the incredible efforts that individuals were making to advance themselves by, um, through immigration in different parts of the country. And Leading to fragmentation of families that mm -hmm. was in the extreme. You know, Absolutely. We see each other for years. Yeah. And I just wondered if you had any comment on that in terms of the parallels with. Absolutely. I mean, um, uh, migration theorists, migration scholars, um, we've all have both commented, analyzed, and in most cases lamented the fact <coughs> that um, this urban rural divide. Uh, for example, the large number of young women working uh, in um, assembly plants, whether it's making uh, uh, what uh, com computer components or making Nike sneakers, um, the fact remains that many of these assembly plants are 80 to 90 percent female, and it it accentuates the rural-urban divide because if you have that many w women working in a site like that, inevitably that creates uh, a gender dynamic, uh, if you will. Um, as some of you know who traveled to China, there's still these men, uh, especially in the markets, who uh, trot around with those canes, those, those sticks, 
carrying things. And there's a derogatory name for those men. And part of the, uh, uh, how should I say it? It, it? Again, it's almost a racialized epithet, uh, if you will, for the young, sophisticated engineers, computer programmers, and so forth and so on to see these men. And they're made fun of, they're ridiculed, and so on. In the same way that the, the country hicks who are working, at least up until the, what seems to be, God forbid, a recession in China uh, in that respect, uh, lived in these hovels and shacks and so on in the construction sites all around the, on the, the coastal areas, south coastal areas in particular of China. And they were looked down upon and this sort of thing as country hicks. They had uh, what you and I would call basically racialized epithets toward them, uh, etc. Nobody wanted to deal with them. You know, the, they were ostracized uh, and the like because you could tell they were from the country. All you had to do was hold their hands. Right, rough cuts and so forth and so on, calloused hands, uh, etc., as opposed to the pampered hands of the men and, and often the women who hired them uh, and so forth and so on. Uh, this is an ongoing story in any country where you have a rural urban divide that is accentuated by differences of access to what we would call modern, modern uh, modernity, modernization, or globalization. Because a lot of these workers become immediately globalized, whether it's in the form of going to a Starbucks, or going to a McDonald's, or, or wanting a particular kind of American or European product, as the case happens to be. And one, I mean, I can't tell you how many uh, young people in these towns their, their parents uh, are working as domestics or in a garment sweatshop and so on, but they have a cell phone, all right? Because that's become the imprimatur, in a sense, of being with it and so on. Uh, and believe me, I'm not with it. My, my nephews and nieces always, you know, make fun of me because I still have my old cell phone that I can't text from, can't receive texts, and so forth and so on, all right? Uh, and it's a flip up. You know, and I don't know about doing this number or going up and down, uh, etc. All right, and they make fun of me uh, in this respect. And I say, well, I'm a dinosaur. I might as well live like one. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I don't uh, uh, truly understand why you would say these epithets are derogatory. Because I are almost racialized, I mean, you say in, the term, in China. I mean, is it because these are uh, different ethnicities that come from the hospital into the city? Well, there, there are, keep in mind, ethnic differences in China, yeah. all right? And these ethnic differences are part of, you know, one's mental makeup, uh, if you will. And to the extent that many Chinese see the country people as being literally ethnically different, you know, like darker skinned and this sort of thing, they dress differently, they, they, their dialect isn't the sophisticated Mandarin, etc., uh, etc., et and all those things combine, not to mention class differences and so on, combine to create a sense that these people are different. <coughs> that's, that's what I'm getting at in terms of racialization, right, where you use uh, uh, terms and so on in order to create a divide, to construct a divide. Because right? we all know racism is a social construction uh, in that respect. So in the same way people look down at Italians and this sort of thing at the beginning of, and you all teach this, right? The Immigration Act of 21, 24, and the motivations behind it, and so forth and so on. Okay. Yes, ma'am? Doesn't it, in a way, make sense to align oneself with, oneself with the haves instead of the have-nots? Because all these, you know, third world immigrants and so forth, they are the have-nots. They're on, they're hoping to become the haves and kind of move into that. But currently, they're on the outside, and so people want to hold on to what they have. And so, in a way, it, I'm not saying it's the best part of human nature. No, no, no. It is human nature. I mean, that one <coughs> moment in the film where uh, the, the uh, David asked the woman who obviously has her own business. I don't know if you remember that. She's Latina. And I said, well, what do you think about the, the, the city officials and this sort of thing? She says, no I don't want to comment on yeah. that. 
because she was afraid of the consequences, right? That people wouldn't come to her business any longer, and so forth. And I mean, the venom that we saw in some of those scenes, right? Mm -hmm. The man who turns away from the camera, but you can hear him say, he deserved what he got, mm -hmm. right? And that sort of stuff. I mean, it's really ugly stuff in there. And I suspect all of you know this, but there's a great website, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, you know, I mean, it's, it's really terrible to read those stories uh, in that respect. But they've made it uh, what their, their focal, focal work to uh, concentrate on, on things that we would call hate crimes uh, and the like. We, we don't have a website like that yet for Latin America, but I'm sure it's coming soon. Yes, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you for your insight. And this is just really enlightening. And to affirm some things I knew, but it's just it's just interesting to hear about the migration and how those patterns actually are everywhere. Uh, in particular, the dynamic with young men and women and the whole courtship and you know all of that. You know, men are having a you know complicated problems about who are they, and then the death they like to have a partner, and they are competing. And it's just it's just unfortunate. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. The ravishing woman from Mexico. Yes. <laughs> 16 was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I can't even remember how to spell it. It's been so long ago. <laughs> um, you started off with this very touching story about a woman and uh. her child who was <coughs> killed, really, mm -hmm. through a, a similar kind of incident. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that those exist in Latin America, but the militarization of our border has caused so many more deaths than this individual mm -hmm. you know, hate crime. That we see in that tragic film watching the world. Yeah. I, 15 years ago, I took community college students to Mexico to Tijuana to study the impact of U.S. policies. And it was just after the Gatekeeper, mm -hmm. just like four years later. Gatekeeper. So mm -hmm. the wall was yeah. up in some parts, and people were already going out to the desert and dying. Um, but the thing, I just wanted to comment on this. The thing that struck my students, <coughs> one, one of the things that struck them very deeply, was how the migrants who had been really forced out of southern Mexico to NAFTA mm -hmm. and the loss of their corn farms, um, that they were considered by everybody we met in Tijuana as heroes. That they were seen in, in a very well, like they were risking their lives mm -hmm. to come help their families who had been in poverty sure. or further in poverty. Right. So is, the, is there anything comparable to this elsewhere in Latin America? It's, uh, it's spotty selective. The best example is probably President Rafael Correa of Ecuador, who has set up a program, uh, a, they call it Bienvenidos, and it's about return migration, encouraging people to come back. You know, we want you, we love you. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're heroes because you've left in order to help your families and so on, but it's time to come back and bring those skills and, and gifts that you took, in a sense, and bring them back to your home country and so on. Uh, Evo Morales, to some extent, who's uh, used this whole issue of the 1904 treaty and so on to try to mobilize people, basically talking about reparations. Because so many of our people have been victimized by the long-term consequences of this treaty. This is why so many of them are leaving and they're being mistreated and so on because they are Bolivians, right? And we need to, in a sense, redeem that, that ourselves and our country and our history by demanding uh, a, a, a um, or I should say rescinding the 1904 treaty and negotiating with Chile for a new relationship uh, and this sort of thing. Good luck. <laughs> that sort of thing. I don't think the Chileans are going to give up give uh, the 1904 treaty very easily. I've gone way over my time. You've been very nice and kind to me with your patience. Thank you so much. And yeah, yeah.